Can you connect me with the public affairs officer, please? Public affairs, media relations. Okay, the second. Public information kind of guy. machines. any machines. I wanted to get a piece of data to take to the city council. Like how many people are complaining about crimes that are occurring on the internet. That's what I want to know. And how how many arrests they've made <laughs> as in none more likely. Who a little cold this morning. Um, what was I doing? Oh yeah, we're calling them. Hi, um, I called last week and I think I spoke to someone named Mary. Yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm Tommy Wasserberg calling. How are you? I'm okay, thanks. Did you get any response? Um, I, um, our chief of staff, uh, forwarded to, uh, let me go ahead and log in and see. Um, Tommy Wasserberg, I don't believe I got any response, but, um, Yeah, there's a number of questions, and one that came up this morning that I realized um, is I'd sure like to know how many people are complaining about crime on the Internet and what kind of response they're getting from the Tucson Police Department. And 
you would like to know. Okay, so you, you would like to know how many people are complaining that the con of uh, internet the harassment, internet fraud, all kinds of stuff happens on the internet to people, and there's no enforcement. You want an okay. eye, yeah, you want an eye opener, and this is something that needs to be addressed at a legislative level. Uh, you know, I, I've been trying to press uh, Congressman Griava's buttons on this and getting nowhere either. You want an eye popper, go Google organized cyber crime and organized cyber bullying. There's no enforcement. Let yes, me, I'm going to go ahead and add this additional question to it, and I'm going to say that you called today as a follow-up, and you have not heard from anyone. So, no, I haven't. Uh, you know, okay, so uh, Hyde, you know, Hyde has not responded to, there were two, at least two emails Hyde didn't respond to, and I haven't even tried to call them at okay. this point. And your number is 241-2778, correct? 2776. <laughs> two seven seven. I did write down two seven seven six. Okay, thank you so much. I will um, follow up on this and uh, send them the additional questions, and hopefully you'll get a reply today. I'm going to request that you get a reply today. Okay. okay. If I have thank a, you. Yeah. Thank you. Happy day. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Oh, I should go grocery shopping. <laughs> it's like 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, I really, you know, there's only two things missing from my life. It's a, a lover and, and a lawyer. Yeah. I met a guy I was hoping would work out as a friend. He's just like, I guess, too much of a hermit. He just stopped even answering the phone. We got together once and I don't think he comes out much. <laughs> Gets him and his mother and that's it. Oh well. So just like um I do have some friends in town. Hopefully they'll show up for my birthday party. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll, I'll call, I'll call Rain and snow with him, make sure he comes out, get him to twist some wire. Dangle some money in front of his face, he'll come back. Uh, <laughs> My heinous keeps threatening every time I see him. <laughs> Eyes up on the roof. <laughs> well, not much going on this morning outside of the usual shit. Trump is out of his mind. Oh, yeah, happy, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. I suppose I should... <laughs> I suppose I should read this. Celebrating Genocide, Christopher Columbus's Invasion of America. Uh... When, when your people came to our land, it was not with open arms, but with Bibles and guns and disease. You took our land, you killed us with our, your guns and disease, and then had the arrogance to call us godless savages. In 1492, the natives discovered they were Indians, discovered they lived in America, discovered they were naked, discovered that the sin existed, discovered that they owed allegiance to a king and kingdom from another world and a god from another sky. And this guy that invented the guilty and the dress and had sent to be burnt alive who worships the sun, the moon, the earth, and the rain that wets it. That's by Eduardo Galliano. A good friend of mine, a member of the Republic of Lakota, had a meeting with her first grade son's elementary school principal. Apparently her six years old was being defiant in classroom. What were these defiant actions? 
Well, upon his teacher explaining Columbus Day and honoring the courageous and brave sailor who discovered this land in 1492, he had a couple of questions for the teacher. He wanted to know how it was possible that Christopher Columbus discovered a land in which his ancestors had lived for over 30,000 years. He wanted to know what happened to all the people who lived here in 1491. And he wanted to know why the man responsible for invading his native land and slaughtering his ancestors was being honored. I'd love to just be a fly on the wall of that meeting with the elementary school principal. Christopher Columbus did not discover America. There I said it. That it had been here. <laughs> and, and people from other places had been coming here for a long, long time. But that is only the beginning of the secret atrocities that shaped the nation that we know today. The Spanish conquest of the Americas, preceded by its discovery by Christopher Columbus, or Cristobal Colon, as he was known by the Spanish crown, resulted in mass assimilation, raping, slaughtering, enslaving, and intention to wipe out all evidence of a native population of between 50 and 100 million indigenous people from the land, the greatest genocide in recorded history. These well-documented atrocities include forced hard labor, abducting and selling children into the sex trade as young as nine years old, mass raping of women and children, the amputation of limbs of slaves if slaves were not reproducing enough, labeled as hostile savages if not in complete compliance with their oppressors, buried alive or burnt alive if you're resistant to the conqueror's demands, offering cash rewards for the scalps of men, women, and children as proof of murder intentionally spreading smallpox disease as an early means of biological warfare, forced removal from homes and land onto small reservations with barren, unlivable conditions, death marches of more than 1,000 miles to these reservations in which, if you were unable to continue the walk, you were left for dead and unable to assist dying family members. On these same reservations reserved for the indigenous people, once this land was deemed valuable, the reservation agreement was broken and they were forced to move once again. All 370 treaties signed between the U.S. government and Indian nations have been broken by the United States. Public execution of those who did not follow orders. Children were murdered by slamming them against stone and tree trunks, while pregnant women's bellies were sliced open on public display as a warning to those who did not comply. Those same mass murderers became labeled as heroes after sweeping through villages and slaughtering unarmed civilians. Uh, one of the first of them was our first president. That's an interesting story, too. We'd probably should read that today. Systematically kidnapping children and forcing them to a boarding school in which they are beaten, forbidden to speak native language, brainwashed into becoming Americanized, and often molested not entitled to the rights of citizenship in their own land until 1924, not included in the initial Civil Rights Act, did not receive equal legal protection rights until 1968, not allowed to practice their own religion spirituality until 1978. In the 1970s, the attendance at these brutal boarding schools peaked, and it was not until 1975 that the United States government emphasized reduction in boarding schools, with most of them finally closing in the 1980s and 90s. In 2007, there were still 9,500 American Indian children kept in boarding schools. Traditional lifestyle mocked and ridiculed in mass media and in the classroom, socially acceptable to discriminate against, altered their history by ignoring and denying the truth for the past four centuries. These were the policies of our government, the United States of America, as well as the Spanish Crown and the Pope of the Catholic Church. These atrocities weren't conducted by aliens from outer space. No, they was done by aliens from the east who entered an occupied land with force to subjugate and exterminate the civilizations that had existed for at least 30,000 years. <coughs> Some estimates are as high as 200,000 years. And although they became icons of the national myth, only a small proportion of colonists were actually pilgrims and Puritans who arrived in the 1620s. This is uh, a fair bit piece here. This is getting deep into it. May as well go for it, huh? 
Got nothing better to do right now. Still a little early to do anything. Okay, well, the American Holocaust. This is going to be at least a 20-minute read. Thousand-mile death marches, concentration camps, forced assimilations, mass killings by starvation, and the deliberate introduction of disease. The forced adoption of culture and beliefs. Does this all sound familiar? In John Toland's book, Adolf Hitler, The Definitive Biography, he comments on the Fuhrer's at admiration of the American genocide. I spelled Fuhrer, F-U-R-O-R. <laughs> uh, Hitler's concept of concentration camps, as well as the practicality of genocide, owed much, so he claimed, to his studies of English and United States history. He admired the camps for Boer, Christian, Boer prisoners in South Africa and for the Indians in the Wild West. And often, it wasn't even in the West, the first concentration camps were in, like, Kentucky and Tennessee. And, and of course, that was the West then. And often praised to his inner circle the efficiency of America's extermination by starvation and uneven combat of the red savages who could not be tamed by captivity. He was very interested in the way the Indian population had rapidly declined due to epidemics and starvation when the United States government forced them to live on the reservations. He thought the American government's forced migrations of the Indians over great distances to barren reservation land was a deliberate policy of extermination. Just how much Hitler took from the American example of the destruction of the Indian nations is hard to say. However, frightening parallels can be drawn. For some time, Hitler considered deporting the Jews to a large reservation in the Lubin area where their numbers would be reduced through starvation and disease. However, that is a harsh reality to teach children in grade school, and not all conducive to a sense of national patriotism. So in the retelling of U.S. history, they soften it up a little or change it all together. Discover, invade, or conquer. Discover is defined as me finding something in the course of a search. Invade is it, it identified as an armed force or its commander entering a country region so as to subjugate or occupy. Conquer means to overcome and take control of a place or people by use of military force. Well, uh, they didn't just, you know, they, they found something that others knew was here. The word discover could be applied if something was actually found, but the problem is that Columbus's so called discovery had belonged to someone else for at least 30,000 years. For perspective, it has only been 20, 2014 years since the birth of Christ. That means the first indigenous people first settled the Americas 27,986 years prior, whereas Europeans have only been here for 522. Well, we're up to 529, I think it is, 27, 527. So this is like five years ago. The most interesting part about the definition of the word invade is the term subjugate. And the fact that Columbus used this exact word upon his first encounter with the Taino people of the Northeast South American continent. They brought us parrots and balls of cotton and spears and many other things which they exchanged for the glass beads and hawks bells. They willingly traded everything they owned. They were well built with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and do not, and do not know them, for I showed them a sword. They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They have no iron. Their spears are made of cane. They would, have, they would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Interestingly enough, the term subjugate is defined as bringing under domination or control, especially by conquest, while conquest is simply the act of conquering, which is interlocked with the definition of subjugate. By Columbus's own words, it is therefore indisputable that the land and people of the North American continent were taken control of by military force. In fact, the exact term used in world history is the Spanish Conquest. Despite the fact that numerous other nations already knew of the Americas, Columbus's voyage may have initially been a discovery mission, but clearly upon his first impression of the people of this land, it quickly turned to an invasion. 
Following Columbus's death, Hernan Cortes and Francisco Pizarro continued the task of conquering the Americas. Now, before you disregard this article as a wacky conspiracist anti-American anti post, please understand that this is more about seeking the other side of the story. It is about viewing the landing of Columbus's ships on May 12, 1492, from the perspective of the occupants of that land, the Taino and the Arawak's perspective. When your people came to our land, it was not with open arms, but with Bibles and guns and disease, you took our land. You killed us with your guns and disease, and then had the arrogance to call us godless savages. If there is a heaven and it's filled with Christians, then hell is the place for me. <coughs> Boris Christopher Colombo, that's in Italian. In Spanish, it's Cristobal Colon. In Portuguese, it's Cristobal Colombo. In American, it's Christopher Columbus. was born in Genoa, Italy in 1451. He grew up working on ships and began sailing at age 10. After delivering goods to northern Europe in 1476, upon his return, his ship was burnt by a group of French sailors, and he swam to shore in Portugal. He remained in Portugal and started working for the kingdom, which had the finest fleet in the world at this time. During the Middle Ages, the kingdoms of Europe made their wealth by trading with Asia. But in 1453, the Turkish Empire cut off all land routes between Europe and Asia, and the race to find a sea route to Asia soon began. Columbus sailed along the coast of Africa, trading with the colonies and learning of the currents and wind patterns of the Atlantic. In 1487, another Portuguese sailor, Bartolomeu Dias, made his way around the southern tip of a uh, Africa and located the eastern coast, giving strong belief to a quicker route by, to Asia by sea. Columbus had already believed that the world was smaller than that of the common held belief of this time. Once Diaz made his discovery, Columbus's desire to sail west intensified as he had been seeking a sponsorship for a trip across the Atlantic as early as 1484. <coughs> Please note that nobody in the 15th century believed that the world was flat. This is an outright lie perpetrated by the American school system. The Greek philosopher Pythagoras first theorized, theorized that the earth was a sphere nearly 2,000 years before Columbus was born. Aristotle, 4th century BC, added more proof to this theory by observing the motion of the stars. As historian Jeffrey Russell Burton once stated, with extraordinary, extraordinary few perception, exceptions, no educated person in the history of Western civilization from the third B.C., the century B.C. onward, believed that the earth was flat, except, of course, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> Columbus was rejected funding by Portugal, twice by Italy, Spain, England, and France. However, upon the Spanish kingdom conquering Grenada, they were more willing to fund his voyage of three trips and 80 men. Struggling to find a crew, Queen Isabella released prisoners early to join the voyage along with other criminals, conquistadors, and pig farmers. These men did, that did not fear dying at sea, as it was far more appealing than what life had in store for them in Spain. Lots of more Jews. Following Spain's capture of Grenada, there were also some unemployed former military men that were sent along on Columbus's voyage. So, in August of 1492, after eight years of trying to make a voyage around the world, Columbus set sail seeking the riches of Asia. His first voyage, Christopher Columbus, uh, the first voyage, let's not just, that's, that's going to be quoted again in the story. I read it twice. The first voyage to the so-called New World was highly unsuccessful, despite the credit and admiration it has since received. After weeks at sea, with a disgruntled crew of men, Columbus gave an ultimatum to find land in the next two days or head back to Spain, dated October 10, 1492. As unfortunate fate would have it, two days later, Rodrigo de Triana, was the first to spot an island, which is the modern-day Re Dominican Republic, located between Haiti and Puerto Rico. 
However, with a large payout at stake, Columbus claimed that he actually spotted the light the night before, hence claiming the lifetime pension from King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. Columbus claimed the land for Spain and renamed it San Salvador, although it had been occupied for thousands of years by the Taino, Arawak, and Lucayans, all, all extremely hospitable peoples, per many written accounts. Early estimates believe that there were up to three million indigenous people living in the Caribbean, whereas more recent study believe that number to be closer to eight million. As written in his journals, his first encounter with the Taino, uh, these people have no religious beliefs, nor are they idolaters. They are very gentle and do not know what evil is, nor do they kill others, nor steal, and they are without weapons. Columbus quickly captured a handful of Taino to help him guide, uh, help guide him to find gold, while putting many into forced labor and sent thousands back to Spain to be sold as slaves, although well, most of them died on the journey back across the Atlantic. As soon as I arrived in the Indies, in the first island I found, I took some of the natives by force in order that they might learn and might give me information of whatever there is in these parts. And so it was that they soon understood us, and we them, either by speech or by signs, and they had been very serviceable. Merry Christmas, 1492 style. After a few weeks exploring around Cuba, <coughs> Columbus made his way back toward Hispaniola, now the Dominican Republic. On Christmas Eve, the Santa Maria shipwrecked before making it to land. The Arawak Indians saw the men struggling, and their chief ordered all his men, including the chief himself, to swim out to sea and help the settlers to safety. Biggest mistake they made. The Arawak invited the settlers into their home. Columbus wrote the kind of hostility, wrote the kind of hostility of the Arawaks. They are artless and generous with what they have, to such a degree as no one would believe them believe but him who had seen it. Of anything they have, if it be asked for, they never say no, but do rather invite the person to accept it, and show as much lovingness as though they would give, give their hearts. With not enough room on the two remaining ships, <coughs> Columbus left 39 men behind to settle a fort in which he called La Navidad. When Columbus returned to Spain, his stories of the New World impressed the king and queen, mostly due to his large exaggerations of the amount of gold present in the Caribbean. Spanish royalty granted him another voyage, but this time with 17 ships, 1,200 men, plus livestock and weapons. Columbus consistently wrote about the kindness of the people that he encountered on his first voyage and shared this with the Kingdom of Spain. They're so naive and free. Oh, uh, the, uh, oh, we read that already. The natives brought us parrots and balls and cotton and spears and many other things. They willingly trade everything they own. They were well built with good bodies and handsome features. They do not bear arms and they do not know them. For I showed them so that we said that. We read that earlier. On May 4th, 1493, the beginning of the Spanish conquest took place with the approval of Pope Alexander VI. The Pope stated that any land not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed and exploited by Christian rulers. He declared that the Catholic faith and the Christian religion shall be exalted everywhere and be everywhere increased and spread, that the health of the souls be cared for and barbarous nations overthrown and brought to faith itself. And here we are, 520 some odd years later, 27, 27. Disregarding the sovereignty of non-Christian populations, this philosophy became known as the doctrine of discovery. 
and became the basis for all European land claims in the Americas, and continued with the United States Western expansion into the 1800s. As the United States Supreme Court case in 1823 stated, the principle of discovery gave European nations an absolute right to New World lands. Essentially, this doctrine stated that the American Indians had no right to their land, and it was not until 1924 that Native Americans were allowed citizenship on the land discovered out from under them. I use the term Native Americans to highlight the irony of not being granted citizenship to their native homeland until 450 years after the Europeans took their land and tried to wipe out their civilization. Following his first voyage, Pope Alexander VI granted the New World to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella claiming, we of our own motion and not at your solicitation do give, concede, and assign forever to you and your successors all the islands and mainlands discovered and which may hereafter be discovered toward the west and south, whether they be situated toward India or towards any other part whatsoever and give you absolute power in them. Later, <coughs> <coughs> Oh, we're almost done. We still have a ways to go here. It's another 10, 15 minutes. Later, as word of the mistreatment of the natives reached the Spanish kingdom, Queen Isabella finally made a stand. She proclaimed that the natives should be given the opportunity to convert to Catholicism before being forced into slavery. It wasn't that kind of her. Sadly, claiming slaves of anyone non-Christian was not a new trade. Back in 1455, the Pope issued a statement allowing Portugal to enslave any and all non-Christians. Columbus himself got started in slave trading in 1480s as he sailed along the west coast of Africa, picking up slaves for the Portuguese kingdom. Then on his third voyage, Columbus was the first to bring African slaves to the New World in the Dominican Republic, claiming that one African slave is equal to four Indians. <coughs> no, this is not COPD. It's post-nasal drip. Dust, pollen, and smoke. <laughs> By 1514, the Spanish conquistadors carried with them an ultimatum inquire, entitled The Requirement, in which the Indians were forced to accept the church as the ruler and superior of the whole world. The requirement warned the natives that the consequences for non-compliance we shall take you and your wives and your children, and we shall make slaves of them, and as such shall sell and dispose of them as their highnesses may command. We shall take away your goods and shall do all the harm and damage that we can. On the second voyage, The king and queen were of Spain were eager to fund a second voyage following Columbus's reports of his first trip to the so-called New World. In its largely exaggerated accounts, Columbus shared that Hispaniola is a miracle. Mountains and hills, plains and pastures are both fertile and beautiful. The harbors are unbelievably good, and there are many wide rivers, of which the majority contain gold. There are many spices and great mines of gold and other metals. Columbus returned in 1493 to find the fort at La Navidad had been burnt to the ground and all 39 men were killed. It was reported that these men apparently had misbehaved. Of course, by misbehaved, it meant they raped the native women and children and tried to steal whatever they could get their hands on, raising the ire of the native population. In hindsight, leaving 39 recently released criminals behind with no rules and laws, this outcome should not have surprised Columbus. However, the Spaniards retaliated and forced Columbus forced all natives aged 14 or older to work in the minefield daily, searching for gold. If they refused, they were killed. If they did not meet quotas each month, their hands and arms were amputated. Many began committing suicide to avoid the tortures of the Spaniards, while others were buried alive for refusing to oblige Columbus. 
The Taino were ki being killed by starvation, worked to death, disease, or murder. The women were given to the Spaniards to do as they choose. Columbus wrote of the innocence of the natives and his intent to sell them into the slave trade. Naked as the day they were born, they show no more embarrassment than animals. Let us in the name of the Holy Trinity go on sending all the slaves that can be sold. With not enough gold to return to Spain in triumph, Columbus rounded up the best 1,000 Taino he could find. He gave half to the Spanish colonists, took the other half to be sold to the slave trade in Spain. As 250 of the 500 died en route to Spain, the conquistadors simply tossed their bodies overboard. With much disorder among the colonists at this time, Columbus left his brothers in charge of the islands as he returned to Spain. On the third voyage, upon his return, the island was more in more disarray than when he left. Columbus embarked on daily feedings, raping, feeding infants to wild animals, and progressing the sex trade of children. Columbus began selling girls as young as nine years old into the sex trade as accounted in his own writings. A hundred Castellanos are as easily obtained for a woman as for a farm, and it's very general and there are plenty of dealers who go about looking for girls. Those from 9 to 10 are now in demand. At the same time, a man named Bartolome de las Casas was aboard the third voyage with Columbus and was the first to speak out about the crimes against humanity in the so-called New World. As word got back to Spain of Columbus's crimes, the king and queen had Columbus and his brothers arrested and shipped back to Spain. While settling into Hispaniola in hopes of fortune of the New World, La Casas was a slave owner himself until 1509, after which he started speaking out against the crime. However, he still believed in converting non-Christians to Christianity, but in a peaceful, non-violent way. While this was applauded by the royalty of Spain, it was simply not followed by the conquistadors. La Casas wrote of these atrocities. Endless testimonies proved the mild and pacific temperament of the, of the natives, but our work was to exasperate, ravage, kill, mangle, and destroy, and the Christians, with their horses and swords and pikes, began to carry out massacres and strange cruelties against them. They attacked the towns and spared neither the children nor the aged nor pregnant women nor women in childbed, childbirth, not only stabbing them and dismembering them, but by cutting them to pieces as if dealing with sheep in the slaughterhouse. They laid bets as to who, with one stroke of the sword, could split a man in two or cut off his head and split out his entails with a single stroke of the pike. They took infants from their mother's breast, snatching them by the legs and pitching them head first against the crags, or snatched them by the arms and threw them into rivers, roaring with laughter and saying as the babies fell into the wall, Water, boil there, you offspring of the devil. The Forgotten Legacy of Christopher Columbus Columbus was arrested, shipped back to Spain, stripped of all his land and titles of discoverer. However, he did find a way to be released and allowed to explore again, and the promise of gold. He presented gold to the king and queen at bribe, and was not only pardoned for his crimes, but allowed a fourth voyage. Christopher Columbus passed away in 1506, always believing he had landed in Asia, with no knowledge that the Americas was an entirely different continent. During the ten years of his four voyages, 1492 to 1502, the population of Taino de decreased from an estimated three to eight million inhabitants to less than 50,000. By the mid-1500s, that number was reduced to just 15, 500 remaining Taino. Before the European invasion, before the European invasion of the Americas, there were believed to be as many as 80 to 100 million native people occupying what is now the United States. According to the 2010 U.S. Census, only 5.2 million people identified as Native American and Alaskan Native, either wholly or in part. And out of this, only 2.9 people. 9 million people identified as solely American Indian or Alaskan Native. <coughs> At the time of the European invasion, at least 300 different languages were spoken in addition to numerous trade languages. 
natives of the Americas were not only living lightly on the land, as is so often claimed, but were engaged in landscaping, building, and architecture, trade and commerce, in addition to sustainable hunting and gathering, and of course, ancient cultural and earth-based spiritual practices, much of which has now been decimated. Christopher Columbus, a liar, thief, rapist, pedophile, savage, torturer, genocidal murderer, brutal conqueror, and pioneer of slavery and sex trades, did not discover anything besides a beautiful, peaceful group of people who had lived sustainably on their land for millennia, who rescued him and welcomed him into their home, implementing what can only be described as sociopathic imperialism, his thirst for wealth, greed, and power, wiped out generations of people within a decade. And for his bravery, we celebrate the day he invaded the land of the people that rescued him. Columbus Day has been celebrated as a federal holiday in the United States since 1971. Then on 9th of October, 2002, President George W. Bush issued a presidential proclamation celebrating Columbus's bold expedition and pioneering achievements and directing that the flag of the United States be displayed on all public buildings on the appointed day in honor of Christopher Columbus. <coughs> <laughs> of course, noticeably missing from his recounting history of history was any mention of invasion, violence, slavery, rape, religious persecution, or genocide. A history that our nation proudly celebrates each Columbus Day. The people who are citizens of the U.S., these are your treaties. They aren't just the Indians' treaties. No one gave us anything. No one was dragging any land behind them when they came here. This was our land. As Native American peoples in this red corner of Mother Earth, we have no reason to celebrate an invasion that caused the demise of so many of our people and is still causing destruction today. And this was dealt with by Susan Schoen Harho. Uh, the Morning Star Institute, which is a Native American rights organization. They used to call uh, George Washington the town killer. He, was, he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't real nice to the natives. But, um, <clears throat> anyway, that's Happy, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Thanks for watching. Happy day. Bye.